looking for intelligence from beyond our solar system. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Avi Loeb, author, former member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, founding director of the Black Hole Initiative, and Frank B. Baird, Jr. Professor of Science at Harvard University. Welcome back, Avi. Thanks for having me. Your resume, list of awards, titles, and accomplishments fill pages. Your latest book, Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligence, Life Beyond Earth, just hit the shelves. What motivated you to write it? Well, um, I look for intelligence in the sky because I don't often find it here on Earth. And, uh, you know, all the titles that I have, um, I, I don't think very highly of them. Um, I'm still a farm boy. I was born on a farm and I'm curious about the world and I try to figure it out. And uh, a few years ago, there was this object discovered that was very anomalous, uh, unlike anything we have seen before. It didn't look like a comet or an asteroid. It came from outside the solar system. And after looking at the evidence we had, all the clues that we had about this object, it looked to me that it might not be natural. It may be of artificial origin. And so I discuss why I arrived at this conclusion in my book. And I also discuss the response of the scientific community uh, to this proposal and the fact that we are not really ready at the moment uh, to the possibility that we might not be alone and perhaps not even the smartest kid on the block. Before we get to the object, at the beginning of most interviews, I ask my guests to tell us a little about their backgrounds. The opening chapters of Extraterrestrial do that for the reader. What's one interesting fact or story that they'll learn uh, about you there? Well, the interesting uh, anecdote is that uh, when I went to, to my first day at school at age seven, uh, I entered the room, the class was in it, and the kids were jumping up and down on their chairs and desks. And uh, I was looking at them and I just couldn't figure out why they're doing that. Uh, what's the point in jumping up and down? And they didn't look like a lot of fun to me and I was trying to understand that. And then the teacher entered the room and uh, looked at everyone and said, uh, Look at Avi, he's so well behaved. Why can't you behave just like him? And I wanted to tell the teacher that I'm not particularly well behaved. It's just that I was thinking whether it makes sense to jump up, jump up and down on, on, on the desks. Um, and that pretty much reflects my uh, uh, journey through life. You know, I'm, I'm always thinking about whether it makes sense to do one thing or another. And I'm not just doing it out of... Uh, other considerations, you know, I don't care how many likes I have on Twitter or whether, you know, uh, it's uh, accepted by the mainstream. Uh, I, I follow what seems to be right to me. And, you know, in the case of this object that uh, appeared, uh, the evidence led me in a path that I describe in the book. And uh, whether other people jump up and down doesn't matter. How did the journey of your life prepare you for what happened in the fall of 2017? Why was it so hard to make the evidence fit the hypothesis? Right. So uh, I started my life uh, as um, a young kid born on a farm and I collected eggs every afternoon. I was very much uh, connected to nature, uh, less so to crowds of people. Uh, I used to drive a tractor to the hills and read philosophy books. Uh, philosophy appealed to me because it addresses the most fundamental questions. But then circumstances uh, led me to focus on physics and uh, eventually astrophysics, astronomy. And, uh, but at the same time, I, I kept uh, the wider view. And um, you know, I don't subscribe to clubs of groupthink. I think independently. And I also think about the big questions. And, uh, Fortunately, astrophysics offers us uh, very big questions. And one of them is, are we alone? Are we the smartest kid on the block? And uh, uh, that, uh, in the context of this 
very weird object led me to consider the possibility that it's the first evidence we ever received uh, that we might not be alone. It's sort of like walking on the beach and seeing most of the time rocks that are naturally produced, but every now and then you see a plastic bottle that indicates that a civilization is out there. Why was it weird? What do you think it was? Yeah, so um, the object itself had uh, just reflected sunlight. That's how we discovered it. But the amount of light that it reflected changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling. And that implied that it has a very extreme geometry. It's at least projected on the sky at least 10 times longer than it is wide. And if you imagine a piece of paper tumbling in the wind, you know, even if it's razor thin, the, the chance of us seeing it exactly edge on is very small. And so um, actually the best fit to the reflected light as the object was tumbling is that of uh, a flat object, pancake-like object, not cigar shaped the way it was depicted in one of the cartoons. And uh, in addition, the object exhibited an extra push away from the sun, in addition to the force of gravity, but it had no cometary tail. There was no outgassing from this object that would give it the rocket effect that would push it. And the only sense I could make of that was that it's the reflected sunlight that gave it the extra push. And uh, in order for that to be effective, the object had to be very thin, sort of like a sail on a boat, except that on the boat, the sail is pushed by the wind, whereas here, it's just the reflection of sunlight. And we are currently developing this uh, technology of uh, light sails for space exploration. Uh, it offers the advantage that the spacecraft does not need to carry the fuel with it. In your opinion, what are the odds that life, possibly self-aware and intelligent, does or has existed other than on Earth in the past 14 billion or so years? Oh, I think it's very likely. Uh, we now know that a substantial fraction of all the sun-like stars, about half of them, have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly at the same separation. And so um, if you replicate the conditions on Earth, uh, it's very likely that you get similar outcomes. I don't think that we are special or unique. Uh, it's a natural tendency of people to believe that we are privileged. And uh, that, of course, flatters our ego. And we used to think that we are at the center of the universe. We are not. Uh, now, some, many people think that we are at the center of the biological universe. We might be alone or unique. And that resembles my daughters when they were young. You know, They tended to think that they are special until they went to the kindergarten and met other kids. And then they realized these other kids have qualities that are superior than to theirs. And of course, it's, it's not so flattering to your ego when you realize there are others out there, uh, but we have to do it. You know, it's a matter of figuring out our uh, environment, our neighborhood. And uh, uh, I think science now has the tools to answer this question that is of great interest to the public. Unfortunately, uh, the mainstream of the scientific community right now is not interested in discussing this question. Um, it's being pushed to the sidelines. It's the search for technological signatures is not funded significantly. And young people are discouraged from doing it. And uh, with my book, I hope to change this culture. I think you can. On that, what comes first? Where to look or what to look for? Right, so there are two things you can think of. Uh, you can have a phone call, you know, you can speak with someone that is alive and that, that's equivalent to looking for radio signals from another civilization. It needs to be alive at the time that it transmits the signal. But you can also imagine getting a letter in the mail. And if the postal service is very slow, uh, you know, you can get the letter when the person that sent it is not alive anymore. And that's equivalent to getting a message in a bottle, uh, sort of a uh, uh, some, some relic, for, technological relic from another civilization that arrives to us after that civilization is dead already. Uh, that offers the advantage of looking back in time at all civilizations that existed. They don't need to be alive at the time that you're searching. And it's very similar to doing archaeology on Earth, where we find evidence for cultures that are not around anymore, like the Mayan culture. 
uh, we cannot have a phone conversation with them, but we can find the relics they left behind. What role does inertia play in trying to answer the question of extraterrestrial life? Um, I think that a lot of people are attached to what they used to think uh, on this subject and uh, prefer not to change their comfort zone. And uh, that's part of the resistance to discussing this topic. But um, uh, science is all about gaining new knowledge. And I don't think you can suppress science and you can delay it. So, you know, the philosophers during the days of Galileo Galilei, they resisted the idea that the earth is uh, moving around the sun. And they argued, no, the, the earth is at the center of the universe. Everything moves around it. Uh, and uh, they put Galileo in house arrest. And uh, that only maintained their ignorance uh, because the earth continued to move around the sun. And uh, the point is that reality, it doesn't care whether you ignore it. It's out there. And if we want to be uh, intelligent and, and gain knowledge, then we have to be open-minded to, to evidence that is uh, uh, unusual to, to what I call anomalies, because that's nature's way of telling us that we are missing something. So should we ever find proof that life exists off Earth? How do you think science, governments, and even organized religions might respond? Yeah, I think it will have a dramatic uh, impact on our society. Uh, first of all, uh, we might realize that we are not the smartest kid on the block. And of course, we can learn new technologies by looking into space. Uh, perhaps they have a technology that is a million years more advanced than ours, and we could import it to Earth. It would feel like uh, copying in an exam and looking over the shoulder of the student next to you. But you know, if it saves us a million years, that's worth it. Uh, of course, it will also change uh, uh, the, the conception that we have about our place in the, in the universe. We are not so central anymore. Just like when my daughters uh, went to the kindergarten, they found others and they matured as a result. Um, and uh, obviously it will have an effect on, on religious beliefs because uh, many of the religions focus on us and uh, do not discuss uh, the, the possibility that there are other cultures on other planets and uh, we will have to cope with that. Uh, but, you know, it's part of uh, gaining a better understanding of where we live, of the universe that we live in. And I think it's inevitable. And, and I think it's exciting, actually, uh, to find out more and not to assume that the universe is just made of physical objects like stars, galaxies, but actually there are living things in it and we are not the only ones. That, that's very exciting to me. It's exciting to me as well. Dr. Avi Loeb, former member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, founding director of the Black Hole Initiative, Frank B. Baird, Jr. Professor of Science at Harvard University, and author of Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth. If somebody wants to connect with you, Avi, maybe they want to get a copy of your book. I hope that they will. What's the best way they can do that? Well, they can get a copy on any bookstore that sells uh, books, uh, in particular, Amazon or Barnes and Nobles. Um, the book is out there and it's already a bestseller by now. Yes, it is. Very exciting. Thanks so much for coming back to talk about it. Thank you for having me. Of course. And find more of my interviews right here on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.